let me introduce you to our guest speaker, a very good friend and someone whose research I look up to uh, because I, I, I like to read sort of the good research he does. And I'm so pleased that he accepted our invitation to, to visit with our audience today and share his, his research, uh, his insights on how to do good quality research. So Bill Wales is the Standish Professor of Entrepreneurship at the University at Albany SUNY. Uh, SUNY stands for the State University of New York, those of you who are outside the US. He graduated with his PhD in management from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in 2007. And for the past 15 years, his research has explored entrepreneurial orientation, strategy making processes and strategic behavior. He's an editor of entrepreneurship. He's an editor at Entrepreneurship Theory of Practice, Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, and also serves on the editorial boards of the Journal of Business Venturing and Strategic Entrepreneurship Journal. So please join me in welcoming Bill to our call today. Thank you, well, Bill. Thank you, Vishal, for inviting me. It's, it's really my pleasure to be here. I think this is gonna be a lot of fun and uh, hopefully I can share something relevant. I, I know you said you like reading my good research, so I'm glad you just avoid all the rest of the bad research. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I will attribute those word choice to English being my second language. <laughs> uh, what I meant is I love reading your research. And I find it very, very informative and uh, helpful. You're too kind. You're too kind. You're certainly a scholar I look up to as well. And uh, our collaborations over the years have been a highlight of uh, my work in academia. So it's my pleasure to be here with you and with the whole audience. So welcome, everybody. I'm uh, glad to meet many of you for the first time, uh, at least face to face. Thank you, Bill. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned to you, we'll start with my first question. How did you get interested in entrepreneurship research? I'm assuming when you were 10 or 12 or 15, you didn't tell your parents, I am going to be an entrepreneurship professor one day. So how first, does sort of the interest in entrepreneurship research happen? Yeah, first words out of my mouth, um, entrepreneurial orientation. Um, <laughs> yeah, so right. So we, most of us don't don't sort of find our ways. We, we, we have sort of unique paths, I guess, in terms of how we get into academia. Um, I did all my degrees at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, and uh, I started in information technology. I, I got on to a grant where I started doing research and writing white papers working for the US uh, Air Force at the time. And that was really interesting. My advisor, uh, the, the principal investigator on the grant, uh, who I worked very closely with in, in the Lally School of Management at RPI, Tom Triscary, you know, if we think back over our lives, I, I think everyone kind of identify a handful of people that really just redirect the trajectory of our careers and our lives. Um, so certainly Tom was one of those people for me uh, who really encouraged me to apply for the PhD program. And we were going to work on IT-based, you know, decision-making group decision support system kind of oriented research at the time, effects-based operations and other things were really big terms that have since fizzled out and become not very popular at all um, in, in the decision-making literature. But uh, then Tom ended up taking a leave from RPI to, to go work um, for uh, in areas around Homeland Security. And I was admitted to the PhD program and trying to figure out what do I wanna do? Uh, you know, if I'm not gonna be working with Tom, who am I gonna be working with? At the time, Mike Inslee was there. He set up a meeting with me and we started talking. He said, what about entrepreneurship research? And that was another pivotal, pivotal moment that sort of got me thinking, oh, this is kind of interesting. This might be the fun side of business. I always thought of business and management as reproduction of value and, you know, kind of uh, staying the course and, you know, not very exciting, but entrepreneurship seemed really exciting. Like, here's how we're creating uh, new possibilities and new opportunities. And it's this field that's comparatively new to a lot of the other aspects of management with the major conferences in BAPS and only going back to the early 80s. And I thought, you know, this is kind of cool where there's, there, you know, there can be big advances. And RPI at the time um, still had uh, Phil Fan and Robert Barron and a whole bunch of great faculty um, in the era, Gina O'Connor, people that have, you know, really done a lot of great research in entrepreneurship and innovation. So I just kind of gravitated to that area, started researching, uh, more and more in the seminars about entrepreneurship, even when there were strategy seminars, um, and uh, just got 
really interested in the area. So sort of just, you know, uh, w once I met Mike uh, Inslee and then and, and, and started down that path, it sort of sort of certainly accelerated. And I think I was towards the end of my first year, I found a paper on entrepreneurial orientation. I had to read for one of the seminars. It might have been COVID in 1189, I forget. But I remember thinking, hmm, this is sort of interesting. I'm going to write my seminar paper about this and just kind of see where it goes. And that was it. I just continuously focused on entrepreneurial orientation pretty much since 2005. Um, so, you know, my, my friends in the cohort, they, they joked a lot. They joke a lot about how like just laser like focused I've been pretty much my entire career in academia. Uh, but I think it's paid tremendous dividends uh, in a lot of different areas by, by having that focus, being able to make deeper discoveries, um, having opportunities come my way uh, in terms of people saying, you know, in, in early conversations with senior scholars, they would say, well, three papers in an area is really what you need to become well known in that area. If you can get three good papers. So that was sort of always my goal. It took me a while to get there. But once I once I got there, you start to find that then uh, the deal flow in terms of like possible manuscripts and co collaborative opportunities start to come your way because you, you, you are now established yourself. Um, as sort of a, um, a brand, if you will, or something people can look to and say, this person is doing work in this area, they're clearly interested in it, they're maybe hopefully doing interesting work, maybe I can work with them, um, you know. So that's sort of how I fell into uh, to EO research. And um, I guess, you know, when I do talk at doctoral consortiums at like Babson or, you know, it, it tends to focus on a lot of my talk tends to focus on the importance of being focused in your research um, when you're thinking about your research agenda and the benefits that it can sort of portend as I'm maybe an exemplar of that, I guess. Uh, yes, you certainly are. And I use you as an exemplar of that with my PhD students here. So we do have, I, I noticed that some students are already asking, some participants are already asking questions, but I will ask them to hold off so that we can finish with our uh, with our four questions, and then we'll go to the audience questions. So my second question to you, Bill, is can you briefly share with us the trajectory from origin to publication of one of your EO papers? Pick sure. any paper, uh, hopefully not the one you and I have together, but up to you, pick any paper and sort of walk them through. How did you find the research team? How did you publish? What the reviewers like, oh, Bill Wales, this is phenomenal. Where were you so far? Let's publish your paper. How did it go? That happened exactly once in my career. Uh, only one time I submitted it and it was an immediate conditional accept and the journal was not very good. Uh, at, it still is still, I would consider it a sea level journal, but uh, yeah, that, that is definitely the exception. Um, these are great questions. So, so thank you for coming up with them. I think, you know, what a wonderful, I love podcasts and I've loved listening to the previous uh, guest, guest speakers. So you know, I'm really honored to be here. And, you know, I guess the one paper that comes to mind is maybe the most interesting story. I recently had a uh, strategic entrepreneurship journal um, paper get published uh, 2020. It was Wales, Coven, and Monson on uh, EO, the necessity of a multi-level conceptualization. And that paper has the longest history of any of my research. It, it goes all the way back to 2006. So if I can take you back to the beginning of my PhD program, um, I started working on EO, like I said, really early, uh, you know, 2005 or so. And uh, I, I roll into Babson in 2006. It's in Indiana. And of course, Jeff Coven's at Indiana. And I think, you know, boy, I'm, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed. Maybe I can go have a few words with Jeff. And Jeff is the nicest human being imaginable. Um, we, we hit it off really well. Uh, and I basically just went to him and said, I've, I've got these ideas. I've been writing this theory paper, this, sort of this conceptualization paper about EO. It's been around for a long time. It, it had been a lot around for a long time in 2006, but it hadn't had that sort of almost fad-like status as Vishal and I coined in one of our papers um, that has really accelerated. It really took off, you know, sort of in the 20, 2010 plus timeframe. But even in 2006, it had been around for a while. And I said, Jeff, I think there's a lot of open questions around EO um, that we could write a paper about sort of the conceptualization of, of EO. I think, um, may, you know, 
I would like to send it to you uh, just for your feedback. I didn't ask about co-authorship at the time. Just I would like, would you be willing to read it? I would be completely honored. Maybe we could talk sometime over the phone. And during that phone call, we were hitting it off well enough. I said, you know, would you mind joining the paper with me? And that led to this collaboration for you know more than 15 years now. Um, and uh, so this that paper goes all the way back to 2006. And uh, when when I was talking to Jeff, I have this email from 2006 about this paper and the, the title of the paper that I had at the time was EO, a re-examination re of the concept in future research directions. Uh, and Jeff wrote me back and he said, hi Bill, yes, it's possible to view EO as many different things. Now, if you read the SEJ paper, you'll see this, these things, these, these themes come out. Um, just as Minsberg views strategy as many different things, the five Ps and talks about strategy as a plan, a pattern, you know, we might be able to say that EO is a behavior, it is EO as a mindset, EO as a dynamic capability, are all part of a meta construct, this, this broader view of what EO captures, like an elephant in Bill Gartner's paper. You know, we would argue that it's appropriate to view EO in these manners, um, although it can be defensively portrayed in other ways as well. You know, take care of Jeff, um, because again, Jeff is, a, you know, one of the nicest people, Vishal and I both work with, a, you know, just tremendous sort of pillar of the field. Um, so, you know, that goes back to 2006. 2007, we submit that paper to AMR and with uh, section titles that sort of include EO as behavior, as a mindset, EO as outcomes, EO as a constellation of behavior, mindset, and outcomes, expanding EO's unit of analysis. It's promptly rejected from AMR. Um, we, we go through a couple other journals. We end up at ETP with that paper, and the reviewers say, you know, what's really interesting about that is this measurement portion of the paper. Could you expand upon an entire paper on that? And that became uh, COVID in Wales, the measurement of EO paper. And the rest of the ideas of the paper sort of just got discarded because the reviewers in this situation didn't find them as intriguing. Yeah, um, but so then I started thinking, you know, how else could I use these ideas? They were still kicking around a year or two later. It led to this huge just, I went down this path of trying to figure out what is orientation? What is strategic orientation? Like, how do we define this concept? We're going to say something strategically oriented, what falls under the umbrella, all these different types of orientations. And it just sort of led to this whole other stream of research uh, about, then I started trying to overlay concepts from physics onto it. None of this has seen the light of day, mind you. Um, but it's now starting to move into, I've got a JMS well, I guess I shouldn't say right now in terms of it. There, there's a paper under review that's, you know, in, that's, um, that is looking at sort of taking these concepts from that paper about, you know, physics and trying to come up with sort of a theory of firm acceleration for scale ups or, you know, sort of big topic in literature right now. And that was an offshoot of it. Anyways, the idea is because that morphed so much, the, the core ideas were still there. And then they kept moving. And then, you know, eventually we submitted it to, I, I got back in touch with Jeff and said, some of these ideas are still really good. What do you think if we continue to try to revise them? And we brought Eric on board, Eric Monson, um, who helped us sort of really crystallize some of the thoughts. And then it finally got published. So what a wild ride over, you know, almost 15 years to get that paper uh, published to see the light of day. And that's good for our audience to know, because I think people don't often realize how papers sort of need time to get published and that you have to be patient and work and revise and, you know, uh, so, so that's good, good for the audience to know. Um, I'll move to the third question. As a reviewer and editor, what do you look for in a paper? How do you decide if a paper has potential or not? Hmm. You know, that, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, so certainly, you know, methods are sort of table stakes. If it's not done well methodologically, it's going to get rejected, of course. But I, I would say, um, you know, I try to think about in terms of the the expect how the theory is being used in the paper. So what theories are being discussed, or what theories being created, um, and what those predictions are around those theories that are being used, and and sort of how is that informing the hypotheses, and then what is that ultimately you know creating that's useful, uh, useful knowledge for the either the audience being. Uh, additional, you know, scholars doing further research or practitioners that will be using it in some way. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I tend to think, I tend to view the world in terms of trying to think about, you know, theory as a, a method of predicting outcomes. Um, and, uh, and, and oftentimes things are getting rejected because 
they are not very interesting um, and or theoretically grounded. Um, so I, I feel like I do per, you know, I, I hopped on a little earlier and I, I heard some of Vishal's comments and I, I think EO can be interesting even using the covenant 11 measure. But a lot of times these days, it's because you're trying to look at it as a, almost a moderator of a, like creating a context to say, you know, we're just going to use this parsimonious variable to say that the firm is more or less entrepreneurial um, as sort of a moderator of some other relationship. That tends to play, still play very well, even at the top outlets. Um, but, you know, in terms of just, I will say and completely agree that if you just say we're going to look at um, EO driving firm performance moderated by some environmental context, that's been, that's been played out for probably a decade or more <laughs> really, um, you know, with Rosenbush and the meta-analysis, kind of looking at correlations between these variables and already, you know, finding, it, it's got to the point where a lot of these your relationships in terms of in, environmental uh, interactions, are, we know that they exist, they're more typically controls. I mean, if we don't see some sort of environmental dynamism, some sort of industry control, that, that re immediately sort of calls into question, you know, the research because in, in, in higher, uh, in more dynamic environments, um, we're probably going to see stronger relationships. Um, so, yeah. Just a and Bill, the other sort of angle of what I said was the single short studies, right? You, you survey a convenient sample of 100, 150, 200 small business owners with the EO scale, with a few performance items, with some moderator at one time. And you say, okay, I'm going to send this to, let's say, ETNP. As an EO editor, what do you do? I reject it typically. Um, yes, I mean, so the the thing I will I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll say about being an editor is uh, you make a few really good friends and then a lot of people that don't like you uh, <laughs> because being an editor is is about accepting papers and developing papers, but the acceptance rate is really low. So just be, by virtue of the bar being very high, this is one of the things where my wife is in medicine and I, I actually like that model a lot more where a lot of papers, you know, it's a lot easier to get things published and into the conversation and part of the data that then people can, can build upon versus our field where the paper really needs to be, you know, exceptional to make it into the top journals. I um, mean, not to say that in medicine, they don't have to be exceptional for the top journals, but I just feel like in our field, a lot of times it's either, if it's not exceptional, a lot of people put it in the drawer and stop working on it altogether versus taking that data, getting it published somewhere, getting it into the conversation, particularly as we move to, and this is my own just musing, but I think as artificial intelligence gets better and you know, as we start to be able to take into account and data sets are now being published along with papers, it'll be really interesting to see as, you know, I could almost envision a, a running meta-analysis of the strength of relationships as each study gets published, almost like seeing a change in real time as we learn more over time. You know, that, that I think would be really fascinating. But, but the bottom line is because the bar is so high, um, it's almost been expressed to me and to other editors that, you know, the goal is, to is almost to protect the journal, the quality of the journal and to do your best but also to publish things that are interesting, right? So you've got this double-edged <laughs> this double -edged mandate and sword, so to speak, uh, where you have to find interesting research that uh, helps advance the conversation, uh, but also have a relatively high bar, you know, if you're, if you're maintaining, seeking to maintain premier A status. I mean, I, I see most every EO paper that goes to ETP, and that can be as many as, and this is after Johan Des rejects. This will, I'll still see probably, 30 to 40 a year of which we can accept, you know, a few. So it's just, it's just, it's very, it's very challenging. Um, so I try to be as developmental as I can in all of my communications with authors, because it's not that the research is, is necessarily even like terrible, you know, like, it's not like it's, it's bad per se. Um, it's just that it might not make it over the threshold for ETP, for, whereas it could be an excellent publication in any number of other journals. And uh, before we move to the participant questions, I have a fourth question for you. And I know you've, you sort of briefly touched upon it, but I, because it's one of my questions, I'll still get to it. Can you tell us about one EO paper you're working on these days? How did you get the idea where you are on it and so forth? 
Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's kind of, kind of hard to choose, I guess, in terms of, um, but I, I've been working on a paper recently uh, about computer aid text analysis and this measurement of EO using CATA, because I, I think it is fascinating. Uh, it, it's, it's one of those few areas where you can collect a data set and then as the measure changes, you can just reanalyze it um, as, as your measurement improves. But I, I, I think it's a low barrier to get in, but you know, as you were mentioning in your initial thoughts, it's not, it's, it's, it's not clear what we're necessarily capturing. So I'm looking at, I, I, I've been working on research now, trying to look at it from both a measurement and conceptualization theory perspective about what are we actually capturing with this CATA measure? What part of orientation? Is it top management style? Um, you know, and I guess a lot of it depends on the context in which the communication is occurring. And because we can analyze all these different contexts, it does create this really kind of cool sort of universe in which we can study orientation in, in, a, in a much broader sense, um, uh, which is cool because it, it, it opens a lot of opportunities. But, uh, you know, there's also, I think, ways in which it can be inappropriate, uh, inappropriately applied. I'll give you an example. Um, I have a forthcoming uh, SEJ with uh, Terry Wang and Sumit Malik um, that um, looks at um, entrepreneurial orientation within uh, regulated contexts. And, you know, the concept is that signaling theory can be applied to EO. And historically it has in a lot of the CATA literature, but I think it really depends on the context in which you're communicating because EO ultimately in communication uh, can, there's not necessarily a cost associated with it. So for a signal to be believable, there has to be some, some penalty for false signaling for you to say that this, that, you know, that the, 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 the signal I received is credible. So, you know, just in, in a lot of instances, firms are going to be incentivized to, to put forward a rosier image. So impression management is really a, a kind of a, you know, sort of a, a, a phenomenon that needs to be taken into account because you know, if you have a business plan competition, everyone's going to put forward a really high entrepreneurial oriented uh, discourse uh, and rhetoric, but you know, how, how much is that actually tapping into uh, an underlying phenomena uh, around orientation and what is that phenomena? And um, you know, so I, I feel like a lot of times when I get the EO papers that are just really, really broad, that tends to also be less interesting to me than papers these days, which can be much more specific. They can acknowledge that EO is this, this broad animal, this elephant, but there are these parts of it that we can zero in on that need more attention and research. And that to me, that specificity is very important in, in the current era um, in, uh, of, of EO research. Great, thank you, Bill. And now we'll move to Ahmed. Do you want to ask your question? Do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yes, uh, Professor Gupta, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Bill. It's very, I am appreciate your uh, being with us here today. Um, looking to the uh, book uh, about the entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurship theory and practice, if we divide this uh, title in two separate and distinct terminology, entrepreneurship theory and practice. Uh, you know that theory, we can assume that uh, many of uh, uh, theories are similar or there are many uh, contributions of uh, uh, scholars about theories of uh, entrepreneurship. But uh, regarding the practice, um, my question is, to which extent does the practice be different between countries or scholars or entrepreneurs by themselves? The, yeah, so I guess the question is, how much does, does EO hold up across uh, countries versus require adaptation? Um, I, I did, um, there, there is a, a, a special issue uh, in um, International Small Business Journal uh, where actually Vishal and I and uh, Lou Marino and Glina Shirokova talked about EO international, global, and cross-cultural cross research. Um, that was in 2019. I, would, I would guess I would probably refer you to that paper because we, we get into things a little bit more, more in depth there. But I think the, 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 the short answer is that, yes, there, there could be a benefit to adapting EO to the particular 
context um, and to think about what orientation means and other elements, you know, something that's been sort of at the fringe right now has been, you know, networking and, you know, and networking has been a part of the conversation for a while, but, you know, how is, in certain contexts, is, is orientation, can it be separated from, from networks? You know, if we take effectuation theory, the answer is maybe no. Um, so, you know, so I don't know, there's been some, some discussion too, to try to figure out, um, you know, what are moderators, what are aspects of other aspects of, of being entrepreneurially oriented in certain contexts? Um, I don't have the answers to that. Uh, but I will say that if you, if you stick with the core dimensions, you'll, you won't run into people saying that what you're studying is not EO or that you've expand that, that you have, um, you know, sort of created a, an, an EO foul, if you will. If you add another dimension, um, it creates a really high bar that you would need to jump over, as we talk about in that paper, uh, to say how it's fundamental to being entrepreneurial in a particular context. So that's, I guess that's the only thing I, I would add. But yes, there are way, there are there is some benefit to adaptation, um, and I, I would refer you to that work. Thank you, Thank you. Arbindo, Do you want to go next? Yes, Professor. Thank you. So my question is um, to both of you, like that um, entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial orientation uh, is in farm level. So like it has a um, segment of like individual level issues and country level issues. Like uh, individual level, individual people can be like uh, innovative, risk-taking propensity they have. So in that sense, um, entrepreneurship cover like entrepreneurial mindset to address these issues. Mm -hmm. But for country contracts, uh, how we address, a country can be also entrepreneurial, uh, like uh, China or Japan or like South Korea, they are much more now entrepreneurial, uh, innovative in a sense, or um, risk-taking propensity or may have other aspects. So is there any uh, like um, foundation to think about like individual entrepreneurial mindset, uh, farm level uh, entrepreneurial orientation and for country level, the next? Um, I, I will say there was a paper and research policy a few years ago, 2017 um, on uh, entrepreneurial orientation, the measurement and policy implications of entrepreneurship at the macroeconomic level. So there have been some attempts to sort of like zoom out and think about, you know, other levels of analysis as being uh, entrepreneurial oriented. There's also been a lot of push um, to think about what it means for a team or an individual to be oriented, uh, entrepreneurially oriented, which I think is great because a lot of times I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's very interesting, I, I should say. Uh, Tom Lumpkin makes the point uh, in a recent book chapter in a, a forthcoming um, handbook of EO um, that uh, I, I, I'm co-editing with Andrew Corbett, Pat, Patrick Kreiser, and Lou Marino um, that'll be coming out from Emerald Publishing. Um, Tom, makes, Tom has a great chapter in that book, and he talks about how can we look our students in the eyes and, and say, you know, entrepreneurial orientation only exists at the firm level. It's not something that people have. You know, we need to really think about how is it manifest at, at, at these lower levels of analysis and in different contexts, you know, can healthcare workers have an entrepreneurial orientation, for example, how, you know, and it's sort of interesting how, how um, you know, how he pushes uh, the field in that direction. And of course, recently uh, there was the, the paper I know uh, Jeff, Jeff co-authored co uh, on team level EO, um, so yeah, so we're definitely starting to see it at different levels of analysis, and um, I mean that does create create new opportunities, particularly when it's a lower level of analysis. If it's within an organization, then you can start to look at phenomena about how individuals are interacting uh, to bring ideas to new entries in the market, to to bring you know to exploit new opportunities, and you can kind of maybe start to tease out a little bit more of that that causal process um, that, that's occurring. Yeah, Professor, uh, another thing like- uh, uh, Arvinda, we need to move to other, other participants, but oh. we can come back to you at the end if we have time. Zakia, you want to go ahead? Yes, thank you so much, sir. Am I audible? Yes. 
So I want to ask you this, what are the best theories for EO? And how to get the determinants for EO? Yeah, I think um, in terms of the best, I guess that there is a forthcoming article I might re refer you to. Um, it's coming in Journal of Business Research on the status quo. It's called the status quo of research on, on entrepreneurial orientation, conversational landmarks and theoretical scaffolding. Um, that's, I think that's online now. And I, it's actually, I think you can download it because uh, one of my co-authors, uh, Sasha Krauss, paid the, his, his institution paid the fee to make it uh, available to all. Um, but in that article, we talk about, um, you know, the, how the resource-based view has had a big impact upon theorizing and, and EO research. So, you know, if you're going for a, a safer option in terms of theorizing why EO influences performance, um, looking at sort of VRIO framework and, and thinking about, you know, how you know, maybe teasing apart some aspect about how it creates value based on uh, a resource-based perspective would be a reasonable approach to take. Perfect. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Mike, do you want to ask your question? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And thank you, Dr. Wills, also, too. So glad to meet you online here. Uh, I was curious, uh, at some of our earlier discussion regarding signaling for entrepreneurial orientation, I saw from Babson Conference that uh, you had breaking new ground, expanding our knowledge of how firms signal their entrepreneurial orientation and that how you and your collaborators went uh, with word count beyond word count analyses and out your reports, and that you looked at a broader range of communication sources. I was curious about what those other communication sources were. Uh, well, we were looking at, um, you know, like reports within the, in, in the firms using like Glassdoor, for example, to try to think about EO as maybe an aspect of organizational culture. We've been looking at, you um, uh, Uh, analyst reports in terms of, you know, th there's actually, um, so uh, Yen Schuler and Matthias, uh, Matthias Baum, um, two of my, my close collaborators, uh, have actually enlisted uh, a, a whole team of uh, grad students sort of to help investigate all these different sources. And now we're, we're in the process now sort of trying to organize them to think about, you know, are the, in terms of, you um, the focus of the communication, who's talking, you know, what are the, what can they actually share? You know, if we think about uh, even um, external uh, reports, so media mentions, um, you know, using APIs to scrape uh, even uh, Twitter and various other outlets, things that have been more commonplace in the marketing literature, uh, but, you know, trying, to, because they're more interested in sort of perception of brand and things and trying to use some of their tools and sources to start thinking about, you know, how, how might this play out in terms of being able to gauge perception of, of a firm's uh, entrepreneurial orientation um, within, within the marketplace, knowing that it's sort of devoid of behavior and it is its own unique phenomena. So it, 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 it's very much rooted in the context of, of who, who is having this conversation, um, you know, who, who is, you know, the who is espousing this discourse. So I think, I think that's the kind of cool part where we can be very specific to, you know, in other words, who's talking? <laughs> what are they saying? And to who and why? You know, like just trying to get down into these basic questions has been, you know, the focus of, of that, that research that we have in this, uh, this paper on CATA, which um, is still in, the, still in the development phase. It, it's th that, that's just one aspect of, of that research program at the moment, uh, because again, I find it so interesting because I, I, I can see it taking off and, and it, it does have some issues around um, me measurement error too. You know, we're still trying to, to it's a little noisy uh, as a measurement approach. We're still trying to work through too on the measurement side, but I, I you know, it's, it, it's, it's just so, the data is so readily available and so interesting in that, you know, if we think about, entrepreneurial orientation, this goes back to another paper that hasn't really seen the light of day, but has manifested in different parts of my research. Entrepreneurial orientation is kind of a marriage of, uh, there was like a, 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 a prop, uh, I don't know what's the right way to propose it, so, sort of like a philosophy that, you know, your, 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 your goal sort of in life is to have a marriage, uh, you know, coherency of your thoughts, your words, and your deeds. 
right? To have sort of this integrity. So, and if you think about EO, it's your thoughts, you know, what are you thinking? What's going on in your mindset, your words? How is it, what are you saying? And then what are you doing? So like what, at a firm level, it's, you know, what are the top managers and the managers is, is collective cognition. How is that affecting their resource allocation decisions and their organizational configuration about how they organize to pursue opportunities? And then what is, how is that actually manifesting in the market in terms of behavior? So when we have this CADO measure, which is cool too, we know it's devoid of behavior, which also creates lots of opportunities to study relationships that like, when you talk to Tom, you know, he said, well, it's really interesting that I, nor the reviewers caught the fact that we talk all about EO leading to new entry as EO, this, you know, having this organizational manifestation that leads to new entry, but um, we left it out of our models and we just had EO performance. And what did we get for almost 20 years? Models of just EO and performance without really thinking through, you know, how these different manifestations occur. And, and some of that was what I was trying to hit at with, you know, get to in that 2020 paper on uh, multi-level conceptualization of EO. Thank you, Bill. Sadek, you want to go next? Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, like most of the studies on EO apply on surviving farms, right? So we have the data. So how do we avoid the survival bias? That's that's one. And second thing, uh, expanding to all of these questions, I saw that Dr. Gupta and some, some other folks have uh, individual level construct, which is like individual uh, entrepreneur orientation, but these are not published in the top outlets probably. Or uh, if they are published, what, what do you see as an equivalent individual level construct of EO? Um, well, so I, I mean, I, I would point you to, to Jeff's recent work on, on a team level EO, which was basically looking at individual level EO. There's been a couple other attempts at trying to think about how, how does innovation, proactiveness, and risk-taking, proactiveness, Bateman, and Krant, and innovativeness has been looked at in a variety of different ways. And there's, so there have been these scales that when pieced together sort of create um, an impression of, of EO among individuals, uh, which, you know, but, but to your point, um, for the top journals these days, you know, if you think about like public and psychology, like Journal of Applied Psychology, it's very difficult to publish just one study these days. You sort of need multiple studies. So what I would say too is you might put together your measure of, of individual entrepreneurial orientation using ideally one maybe that's already come in the past, but then also think about what you're trying to tap into and maybe having a study too, where you, where you take a different variable, a different way of thinking about that and trying to see if the results still hold. If you're going for a top tier journal, multi-study design um, is, is, is a lot more attractive these days. It does sort of, it forces you to be more clear and concise in your theory building because you use a lot of the paper into having, you know, study one, study two, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and it does afford you um, greater, uh, you know, sort of greater confidence in, in your findings. Thank you, Bill. Ashneet, you want to ask your question next? Uh, yeah. Thank you, professors, for the insightful discussion. Professor Bill, uh, my question is that, can you please elaborate on uh, the process of narrowing down two specific variables for your study? How do you go about that process? Um, well, the, the, I mean, the variables derive typically from your, your research question. I mean, ideally you're, you're starting from the top and, and moving down to try to think about, um, you know, what, what is going to, what is going to be interesting, um, you know, in terms of, I guess, in terms of narrowing down, that's a really fascinating question, right? Because now you're getting into like a researcher's individual heuristics sort of in, in biases. But I would say where I start is thinking about the overall view of the literature. And that's why focusing on one area is really beneficial in terms of an econ you know, economies of scale, so to speak, too, is I, you, you have a good mental map of what's been studied and you've got sort of good databases too of having, you know, I sort of keep a running database uh, of, of all the studies and sort of what they've looked at and variables and stuff. And I kind of see what's already been done that's kind of neighboring to that, you know? So in other words, am I breaking new ground or not? Uh, our field is very, very, uh, for better or worse, focused on breaking new ground. So I can't be like, if, if I'm going to be the second study that's looking at, you know, EO 
and narcissism, you know, wh what is it, how do I take into account what's already been done? And, you know, what am I going to hopefully potentially add that might be interesting? Do I not believe some aspect of their findings? Do I think I might find something different in a particular, in a different context? Um, what is the context that I'm collecting the data in itself? You know, um, you know, in terms of who my respondents are, what the industry is, like all of that stuff kind of plays into the ultimate sort of uh, variable selection. And then you're still taking a little bit of a shotgun approach in that you're thinking, you know, I got to cover my bases as an expensive data collection. So I'm going to put a whole bunch of different variables that I think could maybe add some value, you know, that I think are going to help, you know, identify a cool relationship here. And then, you know, some of it is discovery too, you know, like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't expect that. <laughs> um, there's still some of that too, again, for better or worse. I mean, it's, it's, um, I think just the, some of the, how the process unfolds. Now, Bill, before we take more questions, we have exhausted our 45 minutes with you. Are you willing to take one, two, three, four more questions? Um, yeah, I have nowhere to go and my dog is quiet right now. So everything's okay. fine by me. So Alexander, do you want to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Wells, for a very wonderful presentation. Actually, the story about uh, the 15 years of the paper. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding the entrepreneurial intention, intention um, orientation in terms of uh, zooming in uh, in this. Uh, I feel that this construct it is more related to the strategy compared to entrepreneurship because. Uh, can we say that the entrepreneur is entrepreneurial? It sounds like a little bit pathological. And in terms of the making research on uh, startups or entrepreneurial projects, how we, it, it's, it's actually, it's not the entrepreneurial orientation of the firm. How we can look on an entrepreneurial project, for example, at the crowdfunding platform? how we can approach from the conceptual uh, basis and in terms of the measurement. What would you advise? And uh, do you think that this direction can be a promising research? Well, this also sort of ties into the survival bias question from earlier, um, you know, that, that too, I mean, you know, a lot of times we're studying relationships. It's great to have EO if you have the resources to do it and you're still alive and, and everything's going well for you and the environment is munificent and all these wonderful things. But um, now that we have new measurement approaches, we can start to look at EO in younger samples, like particularly like the CATA based measurement, you know, if we're thinking at sort of EO as more of a belief and philosophy and things are, or are part of a discourse, you know, that's something that lends itself very well to that early stage context. Also these new individual level measures can be helpful. That's not to say you can't take the firm level measures as long as the firm has been in, in operating I mean, in a sense, the smaller the firm, the stronger the assumptions hold that the top manager's beliefs and biases and stuff reflect that of the organization's actions. So, um, you know, I, I have worked on studies using um, data from, you know, large mul multinational data sets with student entrepreneurs too. And this has been harder to publish in, in top journals, but active student entrepreneurs that are, um, you know, running small businesses, uh, a lot of them are going to to die off over the over the years, and um, uh, you know if you can find that type of data, uh, you might be able to help hopefully get get around this uh, to an extent. To your other point of your question, um, you know I would point you to uh, uh, the the forthcoming um, handbook on, on entrepreneurial orientation from Emerald, where uh, Lumpkin and Piddick have a chapter where they talk about you know should we should we divorce ourselves? Should we think about it as entrepreneurial orientation? Or entrepreneurial strategic orientation. Are we? Are we actually? Does that? Do we need to sort of be beholden to strategy? Like in a sense, uh, entrepreneurship. They make the argument came before strategy as a discipline. Even you know, in terms of the studies of of creation of new enterprise and all these things. So, um, you know, I sort of view in some of my work still that there is that there is a manifestation as a strategic orientation when you're looking at top managers of the firm. And, you know, historically, if we take um, some of the, the, you know, the classic work of uh, Coven and Slevin 89, it really is sort of, they are, they are kind of capturing this corporate entrepreneurial phenomenon, which is classically a sort of a strategic orientation. 
Um, that's not necessarily the only manifestation, but in some contexts, you know, they are, they are, you know, it is sort of a field straddling concept in a way. Um, but over, over time, I think it is very interesting as we move it into these other contexts that are more clearly, uh, you know, we'll say in terms of this continuum, more, much more, maybe, uh, entrepreneurial than, than corporate, corporate entrepreneurial, for example. Great. Thank you, Bill. We'll move to the next question. Irfan, you want to ask your question? Hello. Hi. Good morning, Professor Gupta. Good morning, Professor Wales. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to ask my question. It's apart from, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurial orientation. Uh, I'm working on the uh, strategic entrepreneurship in family businesses. So, you know, uh, I, I just uh, want to know uh, what should I consider? Uh, I mean, like to go for SEJ because you have been in uh, no, on the entrepreneurial board of SEJ. What things do I need to consider and how, uh, you know, uh, should, uh, how should, uh, you know, I develop my work towards the goal of the SEJ? Yeah, so I think this is probably universal advice, but I would say um, when you're, when you're thinking about your cover letter going to the the going to you know accompanying your submission almost you're you're you're, you're wanting to think about uh, what are the key studies that are already occurring in the journal on the topic um, that you might say you know building off of this work and you know in these areas these people are in their system uh, as reviewers because they've submitted to the journal and you know so so I guess my my point is editors. We all have our biases, right? There's a great book that just came out, Danny Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, just put out with Cass Sunstein called it Noise. I think it just came out like a week or two ago. But the whole point is that our bi we're big, we're, you know, we have lots of biases and our and professional judgment is unfortunately often swayed in ways in which we wouldn't like to believe it is, but it is. So you, you want to make sure that your work is contributing to a conversation that's occurring in that journal and you make it clear from the cover letter all the way through, you know, the bibliography and, you know, the, in the introduction about how you're building on a conversation that's occurring in that journal. Um, and, 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 you know, you're doing that by signaling in a sense through the work that you're citing. So I think it's important just to, to consider, um, you know, cause otherwise, like if you're really off in left field, it, it might not, uh, um, it, it might not be as, as, as clear a fit for the journal, um, depending on the type of, research you're doing. So that's just some thoughts. Bill, before we move on to the next question, I want to remind the audience that we will definitely not go beyond 11 a.m. CST with questions to Bill. I see more people raising hand and we don't have time for all. Uh, so Anuja, do you want to ask your question quickly? Yeah, thank you, Professor Gupta. And um, hello to uh, uh, Professor Wales, it's very nice to be in the session and uh, hearing the good points on what we need to do to improve our quality research. Uh, I want to know uh, what is it that you look for uh, in a paper, uh, research paper, so that it can qualify for publication in terms of a qualitative paper and a quantitative paper? Mm. Well, I very rarely see just pure qualitative papers. Um, but uh, when I do, it's, it's ideally taking advantage of the fact that it has 40 pages to really um, provide some new insight, some new perspective that, that can push the, the literature in a different direction. So, you know, there's, there's before the paper is published and after the paper is published. And this paper is going to certainly help change the trajectory of the way in which people are doing EO research, for example. Um, you know, like th that there's, there's something that, you know, we've missed conceptually that, you know, by doing a case study, like in the vein of Eisenhardt of, you know, six to eight firms and really get digging deep, we were able to uncover um, or, you know, there was something from our review of the literature that we did that has, has uncovered, you know, these ways in which we need to sort of change the way in which, you know, research progresses. 
I mean, if it's a quantitative paper, again, like I said, sort of the methods are, are table stakes. If it's not done well, you you'll you know you won't get very far. You might not get past Johan, probably. Um, you know, like if it's uh, single source cross sectional data, Johan Vickland as the general editor often just rejects the paper uh, as saying that we we've, we've moved beyond that. Uh, methodologically as a field. So, so, you know, if it gets to me and I'm going through it, it I'm, I'm really looking for, you know, again, what is, what is the, what is, what is your perspective on a theory that's, that's interesting, that explains some phenomena, and then you're trying to use that theory to help explain some relationship. Uh, and, and then, you know, what did we learn? Does it, did it confirm the theory? and confirm your expectations or not. And if it didn't, you know, why is that interesting? And you know, wh what are the new moderators, the new boundary conditions to our understanding of how EO operates and all that, uh, all along those sort of. Uh, okay, thank you so much for the valuable uh, inputs. Thank you so much. Navneet, do you want to ask your question next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Gupta and uh, uh, Dr. Bill. Uh, my question is on lifestyle entrepreneur. A uh, lifestyle entrepreneur who is not very aggressive in his business, he is just wanting to keep himself uh, on a normal path or keep improving. Uh, would the constructs of EO be applicable to a lifestyle entrepreneur? That's my question. Thank you. Well, I would say that probably a small business orientation or SBO would probably be more aligned with what you're trying to tap into. Typically EO, it's, it's, it, it, it's certainly, it's certain there, it's, EO really is applicable to any type of firm, um, but it has a, a, a mode almost that leans towards uh, pushing high growth, you know, having bold innovation and stuff like that phenomena that you might not see as much, which maybe in a sense could be interesting in that, you know, oftentimes we think about the average EO in a lot of the samples, when you're studying them in dynamic context and stuff, the EO, you know, like the average is like a six on a seven point scale. So, you know, you might get more variance if you're looking at EO among um, small business owners. I always try to think about what I'm dealing with, what I have, and then what is the opportunity, almost like an effectual approach to my own research. Well, how can I turn that into a strength? You know, like how could I turn, or maybe maybe there's more variance there and maybe that's why it becomes an interesting phenomenon. Umesh, you want to ask the next question? Thank you so much, sir, for the opportunity. Uh, there are various school of thoughts on uh, entrepreneurship orientation, be it political entrepreneurship, there is a new field of spiritual entrepreneurship, various other aspects. So building on the question which Anuja ma'am asked, uh, the qualitative and quantitative methods, do you think the mixed methods in this area, I mean, like uh, the papers which have been published, uh, prove pro effective in the entrepreneurial practice? The mixed methods papers. Um, hmm. I I don't have. I mean, there's not. There aren't many that are coming to mind um, in terms of like like just study one, study two designs. But uh, you know, in terms of like having true true mixed methods. Um, so you know, maybe that's an opportunity when you're. I, I really do think that there there is a benefit to being able to study the phenomena in different ways, um, you know, and having a paper that's more phenomena driven about something you think is really interesting. And here's two different ways of looking at it. Um, you know, we looked at it qualitatively and you now we're looking at it more quantitatively and we're going to put those together in a succinct 40 page package uh, to make our point. Yeah, I think there's an opportunity for that in the literature. Certainly, and would, would, would ETP be interested in something like that? Again, it depends on sort of the phenomena under study and how, how well so, it is. So do we put the participants in a workshop kind of a, a program where they go through this uh, process of knowing about entrepreneurship or, and then we study them through case studies or grounded theory and then we you know, build on quotes and do quantitative analysis? That, you know, that sort of certainly is a, a classic 
uh, research program trajectory. Um, yeah, I mean, you sort, of, you sort of start trying to understand the phenomena more like ethnographic, almost studying them, you know, not necessarily even just asking them. It's almost like, you know, with uh, Steve Jobs saying, you know, if I was to ask people what, what they wanted, they would have told me, you know, or like the, uh, they wouldn't have been able to tell me what they wanted, but I knew that they wanted an iPad, you know, they wanted this intermediary stuff, you know, it was an intuitive sense. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, there's some judgment too that, that you apply in a sense, you're, you're responsible for, for, for being an observer and coming up with those innovations and stuff. And I know we're going to be stopping here in just a, just a minute. Um, so if I have the time to, to leave my, my parting words of advice and wisdom too, I guess I would say um, to be an effective, to, to increase your chances of being an effective researcher, I think networking is incredibly important in our field. Um, so if I was to leave, leave some, some parting wisdom, it would be uh, that if you, if you wait to network when you get to, to the conference, because we will be back in person, I'm pretty sure next year, but who knows? I mean, at some point, uh, my, my words of advice would be um, to, if you wait till you get to the conference to start networking, it's already too late. So you might as well, in a sense, it's a little too late. You should, you should go read, read the abstracts of the papers beforehand. If you have some interesting thoughts on papers, be generous with them and send, send comments to people and, and tell them about them and try to set up meetings with people before the conferences if you can. I think you'll get a lot more out of your conferences uh, a lot better interaction because when you think you come up to someone after a presentation, they're tired, they didn't sleep well, they were out drinking the night before, who knows, whatever. So they're not really maybe in the mind to find the best relationship versus they get an email that comes with, you know, your thoughts and, 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 and who you are and they get a chance to look you up and stuff and, you know, set up a meeting. And, you know, it's something I've done for a lot of my career. It, I can't say I take credit for it. I remember I had a paper published early on in a top journal and, and some scholar, I, I didn't really know very well, just sent me a note and said, this is really good for the field. Congratulations, well done. I thought, wow, it's like really super nice. And I would have never thought to have done that. But then I, I found him at the conference and I went over and said, you know, thank you for that. That was really, really kind of you. And, you know, we've been, we've been friends ever since. And I sort of had this epiphany that, that really virtual networking to facilitate physical networking at conferences is incredibly important to building the networks and building the co-authorship relationships and building communities. And if everyone here is interested in EO research, um, you know, finding other people that are interested in it among this community is uh, really to, to your benefit. But uh, the easiest way to identify people that are really interested and serious about it is to look to the conferences like, uh, like Vishal said, um, and to, to read those abstracts and, and to, to participate in the conferences. Um, I think you'll have a much more satisfying career, it'll feel a lot less lonely <laughs> in some instances. And, uh, and uh, that would be my parting words of advice. So Bill, we usually ask for, you know, one piece of advice, which you already gave, which is, you know, very, very, very useful. And I, I truly hope people will follow. Uh, so before I sort of close, is it correct that tomorrow is your birthday? That is correct. Well, then, you know, from the VS. See our community. We wish you an advanced happy birthday, and we wish, we yeah. hope to continue reading your wonderful papers in the years to come. Well, well, thank thank you for thank you for uh, the birthday wishes. I, I tremendously appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm 29 again, so it's really nice. Uh, and uh, no, I'm just kidding. I really, I really do appreciate it, everyone. Thank you for the time. Uh, this was my my honor. It was a lot of fun, um, and uh, I hope. I hope that I was able to share something of, of relevance to you all. So best best wishes, and I'm sure I'll see you in future conferences. And before you, we let you go, Bill, is it okay if folks who still have questions email you or connect with you on LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever you use, is it okay? Yes, yes, of course, absolutely. Um, I'm incredibly approachable as a scholar. I found some of my, my favorite co-authors and friends and everything through those networks. Um, so, you know, whatever I can do to help you all, please let me know. Um, I will say, uh, don't expect an immediate turnaround because I, I plan on taking some much needed R&R &R, uh, shortly <laughs> as the summer starts to wind down. But, but yes, please, please, absolutely. So thank you, Bill. And Patrick, Vineet, please feel free to ask Bill your questions by email. I know we didn't get to you, but we really need to stop. So Bill, with that, we'll let you go. Thank you very much for giving us your time uh, generously. 
and I'll stick around for the rest of the audience if you have any questions, but thank you, Bill. And I look forward to seeing you in person sometime. Absolutely. Thanks again, guys. Take care.